Good morning, everyone. I'm going to welcome you to Center Point this morning. And I hope you guys have a wonderful time. And if you would like to make your attention to the screen, we'll have a little video of the week's past events. As you can see, we have a lot of fun here at Center Point. We do take the worship of the Lord seriously, but at the same time, we still never miss an opportunity to laugh and have fun and just share it out. Well, hello. Some of you might not know me. I am Pastor Jay. I am a uh, former associate pastor here at Center Point and now the lead pastor at Your Daughter Church in Edmonton, Providence Point. And I used to get up every Sunday and do a What's a Jay Say? And, uh, so him asked me if I would come today and share a little bit with you. Uh, this week, the Lord, Word of God just sort of broke me in a new way. Uh, we do a Bible study on uh, Wednesday nights there in Edmonton, and we were going through the book of Philemon. And, and the book of Philemon is a unique book. It's very short fairly simple book to read and the message simply is God changes you. He changes your attitude, He changes your relationships and, and He wants to change your future. In that book, there's a verse that's rather innocuous meaning that it doesn't really stand out to you unless you know the history. So I'm going to give you some history first. In Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas are on their second missionary trip. They're going around the world spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. There's planting churches everywhere they go. And in their wake, there are thousands of people coming and flocking to the message that Jesus is the hope of the world. And then they're getting ready to go somewhere else. And Barnabas is like, hey, let's take Mark with us. And Paul's like, no, we're not taking Mark with us. And Barnabas is like, well, why not? And Paul says, because he deserted us. See, in Pamphylia, they were together, and then all of a sudden, Mark just sort of was like, no, I'm going to do my own thing, and left them there. And Paul was bitter about it. He was hurt by it. You ever had someone do you wrong and leave you with a bitter feeling? Maybe even a Christian brother or sister that somehow you felt like that union you once had was broken? Paul felt that way about Mark. He says, no, I won't go with Mark. So Barnabas, being a peacemaker, says, okay, I'll take Mark with me. You take uh, Silas with you. So Paul and Silas go off. Mark and Barnabas go off. When you get to the book of Philemon, the last verse of the book of Philemon, verse 25, Paul tells them this letter is from himself, Demetrius, uh, Luke, and he names a bunch of people. And if you don't pay close attention, you'll miss one small name in there. The name of Mark. 25 years later, after that separation, after that relationship had been broken, God had reconciled Christian brothers back together so that while Paul is in prison, Mark is there with him. 
The gospel message is the gospel message of reconciliation. God is about bringing people back together. God is about bringing you back to the relationship for which you were intended. A relationship with Jesus Christ that saves your soul and sets you apart, makes you different. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, even if you felt like you've rejected, been rejected or have rejected God in the past, God wants to reconcile you so that the last verse of your life story will include your name about what God has done. Let's stand together. We're going to open in prayer and, and uh, we're going to take a moment and just uh, ask the Lord's blessing upon this time. We're not going to pass an offering. There's boxes in the back. If you'd like to give an offering, uh, the church will make sure that goes to the ministry here of Center Point and the community and reaching out continue for a sermon. It's really hard. Right. There's a specific time in my life when I really, I was struggling. I was really depressed. During my childhood, I had a great picture put up there, but I couldn't get low. I have like a, a red-headed mullet, you know, baby. You can tell I was born in the late 80s. My mom had to check her shirt on me. It was the most cutest thing ever. This she had a picture of me when I was about 13 before my father had his wreck. And between those two points in my life, I struggled with grit a lot with being bullied, being teased. And right at like right this time, I really put in perspective how far God's brought me. During high school, my middle school years were specifically the hardest. I had red hair. I got picked on because of my red hair, and I had these huge ears. My ears outgrew my head. Specifically, the first thing my wife noticed on me when we met was my ears. <laughs> but during that time period, I had one specific name that all my bullies called me. And I had four or five, it wasn't just one person. Redhead, freckled faced little girl. The longest bully name I've heard so far. But the times that they bullied me, I never stood up to them. I never had the confidence about me. I struggled with insecurities for the longest because of that. Some of the scripture I want to share with you today, the first one, Brandon, first one, the first one. It's in the Daniel, not the Daniel, but the Goliath and the David story. They're just fighting each other. One was on a mountain, the other one's on a mountain, a big valley in the middle of it. A big dude named Goliath is nine foot nine. But he comes out, and it's in two different specific parts of the story. The first one's in verse 10. It says, I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. And in verse 24, he says, As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. I can't say I would do the same thing if a nine foot nine guy was chasing after me. That's pretty big. And then, a lot of, like much of us, we have giants in our life, much like right. Whether it be insecurities like myself, whether it be um, a financial struggle, or your spiritual walk, something peeking in. We all have giants. And the best way to do to handle those is through trusting in your God. But that brings up my second point. Grand open up, My job lasted the majority of my my childhood, all the way up to all even graduated high school. I'm sorry, Scott, I was working in the background. <laughs> but my my bullying and the insecurities I got from bullying lasted the better part of my school year. The whole time I was in school. Whenever David came back and forth from the camp in that story. 
he didn't do nothing about Goliath. He didn't hear Goliath say this till the 40th day. So on the 40th day, David heard him. It's much like our prayer life with our giants in our life. We can ask God to move a certain giant that's in our life. But sometimes God's not going to move that immediately. That giant's there for a specific purpose, for a specific test in your life. And so, a lot of times when we, we pray and we get so, so down and heartbroken, that, that, that specific giant in our life is still there, that we got to remember and remain that God's timing is perfect. He's sovereign. Amen. So a giant's not going to move until he allows it. <laughs> that brings me to my point three. What I want to spend most of my time on. It says in verse 37, it says, The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. <coughs> Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. And then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of metal. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like. For he had never worn such things before. And until we make a stand, until David made a stand to go against this giant, nobody else had it. They ran away. But David didn't make a stand in his own confidence. He didn't trust in his own ability to take this giant. Because he's hitting them bears, he'd be lions, he took sheep out. It was bad. He trusted in God. Every all his bit of his strength came from God. And so a lot of the giants in our life, they're not moving because we're not asking we're not asking God how to move them. We also got to realize that since the giants are there for specific tests or a specific purpose, that we don't look to stay too focused on the giant, but what's behind that giant. Once you defeat that giant, there's a blessing behind the giant. Because once David defeated his giant, he walked into his kingship. He married the big king's daughter. He got free taxes. He won't want free taxes. <laughs> That blessing is behind that giant. And as your life goes on, there's going to be another giant. There's going to be another giant and another giant. David picked up five stones. Look at this five. Five stones. One for Goliath. And if you read on down through Samuel, there were four more brothers of Gath. were four more brothers of Goliath. That David eventually had to face and that David defeated because his sole reliance was on the strength of God. None of it was on himself. When I went on the Emmaus walk, I didn't lay none of my insecurities down to the cross until then. Until, until I forgave them people of doing that, they had a tight rein on me. It's like a lot stayed there until I forgave them. Because once you forgive them, they can't hold chains on you no more. You're free of that. Okay. And once I got the mask walk, it's like God just opened that door and killed that giant and slayed it. And then it's just like the door opened up for a whole new, for what God laid out in my path. Ministry wise, everything. And then came another giant once we got each other got married. Five years in the marriage. I haven't had a baby. She struggles with infertility. I struggle with infertility. That giant in her life, I'm trusting God for what he wants to hear and he plan for us. If it's not having a child, it's not having a child. And we got four beautiful foster babies. And another foster baby that's going home will always be mine. And if that's what his purpose is for us, that's his purpose. 
Church, I really, I just want to encourage y'all not to give up on your giants during your life. Not to give up on somebody that has addiction, some or any financial struggles, any type of thing that's hanging you up, hurt, happy, or hang up. We say celebrate. Continue to pray. Continue to be able to just go after that giant, or that giant with all you've got. With God's might, not what you got. I said that wrong. Make sure you fight in God's power. Yes. Because your power will never be enough to win that battle. Yeah. That was a short sermon today. But uh, I'm going to pray. And if anybody has any giants in their life, they always come to the altar. They always come before God wherever you're at. God's always there. He's just waiting for you to ask. But I want to pray. And if anybody wants to pray with me, come on up. <coughs> That's up to you and God. Lord, we thank you for the giants in our life. Lord, we thank you that they're a battle testament to your will and not ours. Lord, we pray, God, that we always rest in your power. And Lord, even if we don't have, if we don't have the strength to carry on, Lord, we know that you give to us. And we all know that it's not our will, but your will that needs to be done. Father, I want you to be with everybody here and know that let them know that you're encouraging them to walk. Lord, that any the strong ones, God, to be brought down. Lord, be with everybody at the Emmaus. Lord, Father, they have grown, they have grown so much. Lord, that they come back with a, a fire to take down every giant in the hearts of God. Lord, that they set the city on fire. Lord, that they raise up a generation, God. Lord, that's just generation of giant killers. Lord, we thank you, God, and we praise you for all that you do for us. Lord, be with everybody as they go home. Lord, be blessed coming and going. Lord, we thank you, God, and we praise you.